Schiff has been very accurate in his previous predictions. I think he might have predicted some stock market problems a little early, but who could imagine it could keep getting this big? So I want to get into that with him till about 40 after. Then I'm going to give the number out and take your calls on the shooting and give you the latest uh, on that front. But Peter Schiff is with Europac.com, and he manages billions successfully. He also is host of the Peter Schiff Show, is a frequent guest on Fox, CNN, MSNBC, you name it, uh, and this transmission. And he ran for the Senate in 2010. He was Ron Paul's chief presidential advisor on economics uh, in his first campaign as well. And he's a, a school, he's a proponent of the Austrian School of Economics, which is, I would just call the theory of economic reality. It's prima facie or on its face. Peter, I, I know you don't really get into politics a lot, but you're a smart guy. I want your take on we can't say we're boys and girls, we're purple penguins. I'm not kidding in public schools because it's hurtful to be a boy or a girl for somebody that doesn't know what they are. And we're going to ban the Confederate flag and blow up Mount Rushmore and, you know, all this political correctness. But no one can criticize radical Islamists that have now uh, uh, had multiple attacks inside the U.S., uh, attacked, you know, blew up a ship yesterday in the Mediterranean, uh, are just running wild, and Obama puts out a bizarre congratulation before he even says anything about the dead Marines. What is going on here in your view? Well, you know, it's all about political correctness. It's about form over substance. I mean, we don't want to address the real issues or the real problems. Uh, so we want to talk in sound bites about things that, you know, make us feel good about ourselves or, you know, tug at the heartstrings. And, and so I, I think there's a, a political agenda here at work that's a lot uh, stronger than the need for, uh, you know, national security or anything that would actually help the U.S. economy in the long run. It's more about uh, making us feel good in the short run. and We can pretend everything is okay. Now, I know you're down in Puerto Rico right now investigating. They're saying it's the next shoe to drop. Do you agree with that? And what's your take since we talked two weeks ago about uh, what's happened since? Uh, you were, uh, China's degenerating. Things are getting worse. That's what you were predicting. Others were predicting. Uh, what do you see happening? I don't know if it's a shoot and drop. I think it's a problem, and I think it's a it's a look into our future because Puerto Rico has borrowed a lot of money. We've encouraged that uh, by enticing all the debt, by making it triple tax free in the United States. You know, we made it tax free to invest in the government, but not in the private sector. So what we did with Puerto Rico was we helped them grow the government, not the private sector, and that's to the detriment of Puerto Rico. Meanwhile, we enticed all their residents onto the welfare rolls. We made it very difficult for people to get jobs by subjecting them to a minimum wage that is effectively double what it is in the U.S. mainland. So we've wiped out entry-level jobs. Only 40% of the population is employed. Wow. Uh, the rest live on welfare. So, you know, we've, we've hurt this economy tremendously with all these liberal po you know, um, uh, programs that are being prescribed for the United States. And look at how sick that medicine made Puerto Rico. Why would we want to do it here? It's crazy. Where do you see all this going? What's your take on the China situation? A lot of predictions by smart people that this winter is going to be hellish on markets, uh, bond markets, you name it. I mean, uh, give us your analysis of that. Well, I'm, most people are optimistic, I think, on the market, certainly the U.S. market. I don't I don't share that. I, I don't think the market is going to collapse, though, because I don't think the Federal Reserve will allow it to collapse. I don't believe that the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates like everybody thinks. In fact, if you look at the testimony of Janet Yellen this week, she testified up on Capitol Hill, all the headlines were about how she's about to raise rates, how she reaffirms that the Fed's going to raise rates this year. That helped the dollar. That sent gold to a new low for the year. But if you actually look at what she said, she didn't say she was going to raise rates. All she said was that if the economy evolves the way they expect, which is a big if, because it never evolves the way they expect. They've been fact, saying that for two years. If it gets better, they're going to raise them. Yeah, but they didn't even say they're going to raise them. All she said is, if the economy evolves as they expect, it may be appropriate to raise rates. Not that it will be appropriate, but that it might be. And even if it is appropriate to raise them, that doesn't mean the Fed will raise them. I mean, the Fed could say, well, it's appropriate, but we're not going to do it because we don't want to. I mean, it's been appropriate to raise rates for years and they haven't done it. In fact, it wasn't appropriate to lower them to zero. This is not about propriety. This is about expedience. And I think the Fed will keep interest rates at zero regardless of what's appropriate. Now, I always ask the questions when you come on, but but but, what's on your radar screen 
uh, economically? What's Peter Schiff looking at right now, both positive and negative? Look, I just look in, in amazement at how many people can be fooled by this gigantic bubble. And, it, and it's almost as if the bigger the bubble, the fewer people can see it. Because in my mind, this is worse than the bubble that led to the financial crisis of 2008. It's certainly worse than the bubble that led to this dot-com debacle in 2000, 2001. Yet everybody is so sanguine. Everybody thinks the U.S. economy is in great shape. They think Janet Yellen did a great job, just like they thought Alan Greenspan did a great job. He did a disastrous job. We lived through the 2008 financial crisis. That was the payback for what the mistakes that Greenspan made, except it wasn't payback enough because Ben Bernanke and now Janet Yellen came in to delay the full day of reckoning. We still haven't really dealt with all the consequences because we've postponed them with more quantitative easing, more 0% interest rates. But I think the economic crisis that we're heading for, the currency crisis, is going to dwarf as far as the economic pain for average Americans and investors than anything that happened in 2000 or 2008. Wow. What do you expect the politicians to do when that happens? Blame capitalism, you know, blame uh, a lack of regulation, blame the speculators. Who knows? They're going to point the finger everywhere but at themselves. But hopefully because of talk shows like yours, uh, enough information will get out there that more people will know to blame the government, to blame the bankers and the politicians for these problems because capitalism didn't cause them. Had we had capitalism, we wouldn't have the problems. It's government interference with capitalism. That is the cause of all these problems. Now we're gonna go to break and come back. Uh, I've got a bunch of economic questions I wanna go over with you, but what are some of the other big things on your radar you're gonna cover? Well, look at the economic data that keeps coming out. Look at personal uh, spending numbers that came out horrible uh, this week. and. Again, we keep getting more and more bad economic data and everybody just glosses over it as if it never even came out or they just dismiss it and they just assume it's going to get better. Based on what? Based on hope? Just based on Janet Yellen saying she thinks the economy is going to improve? I mean, who cares what she thinks? She's never been right. And even if she thought the economy was going to get worse, that's the last thing she do is admit it. But she does look like a cave creature from that movie, The Descent. So she's, she can get a job in the... In, in, in Hollywood, I'm being sarcastic. We come back, also want to look at Greece and how they voted, but then it didn't matter. The government went ahead and handed over the resources. Sure, Greece is insolvent, but what about the big mega banks too? Aren't they the biggest welfare heads out there? The GAO warns the next debt crisis could be a lot worse. Yeah, no kidding, it is worse. Inflation, real American wages went down in June. Google just had its biggest one-day rally ever and it's the biggest in history for anybody so it's just a bunch of confusion and craziness but i go out there and see the real economy it's in trouble and then i see cash controls capital controls 50 billion in 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 in, in assets being handed over uh, to basically germany and then i see the american people signed on to the big banks that are too big to fail that's my concern peter schiff from euro pacific capital Dot com. My concern is that what about all the corporate welfare? How do we stop that? Again, Europac.com is your website. How do we how do we educate people about this alliance between crony capitalists and socialist lawmakers to domesticate us? Because it seems like when the next crisis comes, they're just going to bring us deeper into the same thing that got us here. Yeah, you know, and some of the biggest uh, recipients of the corporate welfare are the big donors to the Democrats. I mean, they make a big deal about uh, about how they you know, want uh, to redistribute wealth or how they want more equality. But they are uh, giving a lot of money to politicians to prevent that from happening, at least when it comes to preserving uh, some of their corporate welfare or some of their special tax breaks that most people don't get. I and mean, what we have to do is take the power away from Washington so they can't dole out special treatment to their friends. They need to treat everybody equally. I'd like to abolish the income tax entirely and everybody will be on a level playing field. And let's just have a small government that operates based on excise taxes. Sure. But, you, know, you, you just mentioned consumer prices and real income. And I noticed that we got the CPI today, which, of course, is the government's version, which is, you know, really uh, doesn't tell the whole story. But even if you accept their numbers, uh, June consumer prices were up three tenths of a percent. 
And if you look at the annualized uh, real wages, you, you alluded to that, real wage growth now is at the slowest it's been in seven months. And it's not like it's been pretty fast during the past seven months. But if Janet Yellen is looking for you know, the economy to evolve the way she expects, that's not what's happening. In fact, even the housing starts numbers that came out today, the news is talking about, oh, you know, we beat the estimates. But if you actually look at the numbers, there was a drop in single family home construction. The only reason we had all these housing starts is because of apartments. And, and the reason that we're building so many apartments is because the renters are too poor to buy. But you have all this cheap money sloshing around Wall Street looking for a return. And so they're building all these rental units. But if the Fed actually raised interest rates, you'd see a collapse in that market. And I think they're overbuilding the rental market because the bad news is not only can't people afford to buy, they can't even afford to rent. And so they bring more unskilled third world labor in who then immediately get signed up for welfare. That just sounds like a disastrous combination. Yep. Yeah, and, you know, we had other numbers out. We had the Philly Fed. You know, they were all excited because there was a bounce in June. Well, it plunged back down in July. And the employment component of the Philly Fed, that was uh, the lowest it's been since January. Even the uh, weekly unemployment claims that came out on Thursday, the moving average now is now the highest in, in three months. So uh, everything seems to be going the other direction. Industrial production came out. I mean, it's year over year. We just got industrial production for June. It's the slowest increase year over year since February 2010. And auto production collapsed five and a half percent in June, which is probably a good sign that that automobile bubble is popping. You know, we have a big bubble in subprime auto lending. And so that could be coming to an end as well. And if the Fed were to raise interest rates, it would only hasten the demise of that bubble. Peter. If you were president, what would you do to try to restore our country to its greatness? I mean, I think Donald Trump's saying a lot of things that uh, I agree with, uh, but he's not giving a lot of specifics. Yeah, well, I'd probably have to wake up from my dream because I, that's probably my only chance of being president is somehow if I dreamt it. Uh, but, you know, if there was any way I could be president, I'm assuming I'd have a sympathetic Congress in there with me because anybody that would vote Peter Schiff president, I'm assuming they're voting uh, for the right guys in Congress. So we could do a lot. In fact, even if I was president, somehow if you just stuck me in the Oval Office with the current Congress, there is a lot I could do with my veto pen. Probably the most important thing I would do is I would I would veto every single bill that Congress passed, including raising the debt ceiling and any attempt to get around that to try to force the government to cut spending. And I know President Obama has accomplished a lot to grow government uh, through executive order. I would try to do whatever I could to shrink and abolish government agencies and departments through the same executive order. So I, I, I try to do a lot to disrupt the government and free up. Sure. I mean, I mean, we could also say if Rand Paul got elected and made you Treasury Secretary, what would you advise the president to do? So let's come back and walk through more of that because it's these ideas set up as the solution that will be out there juxtaposed against the policy now that we know is making a tiny group ultra rich and making everybody else poor we'll be back with peter schiff stay with us pastor chuck baldwin will be with us for about 30 40 minutes in the next hour we'll continue with calls as well the toll-free number to join us on this live friday edition is 800-259-9231 800-259-9231 and I would imagine a lot of you want to talk about the shooting yesterday and the political correctness where the media, even though the guy's a Muslim, clearly did it uh, as a jihad attack. They won't even say it was for Muslim extremist reasons and Obama won't call it Muslim terrorism. I mean, if a Christian went in and blew stuff up saying they were a Christian, it'd be called Christian terrorism. But all whites were blamed by MSNBC, Salon and others saying all whites are to blame. That was the headlines. Uh, for the degenerate shooter. I am not to blame. How dare you? And I don't think Muslims should be blamed in general. Most Muslims in this country that I know and have run into and the studies I've seen just want to make money and be happy and live in a free country. And, you know, if they moved here and were sworn in as citizens, they read this oath that I'm going to be reading. So uh, if you're not following your oath, uh, you know, it, it means something. And hey, you know, if you are a radical Muslim and want to live in a dirt floor deal and rape women and put bags on their heads and sexually mutilate people and, you know, blow up churches and stuff, go to one of your hell holes and do it. But see, our government blamed Iraq for 9-11, took them out, 
And now radicals have been put in and the country's been divided in three effectively. So America was wrong to do that, and I apologize. I tried to stop it, so did Peter Schiff, so did Ron Paul. But still, I will say, as an American, I am sorry to Iraq. But I will not sit here and watch our government fund ISIS running around committing stuff and then act like they don't know what's happening. And, 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 and I am very angry right now, and we're going to be talking about that. Uh, Peter Schiff is our guest. McDonald's franchises have never been... Uh, this depressed. And, and again, I see that as people voting with their dollars. Not that the economy is so bad people can't afford McDonald's. I think that's part of it, as Schiff has said. But the other part is people are trying to buy healthier food. By the way, um, we're not going to announce this till next hour. Our Facebook has been suspended. And then we made a few phone calls and noticed that other libertarian sites were suspended. Um, not expelled, not shut down. But if you get three of them in a year, they shut you down. They've been giving them to us for just nothing. And uh, we think it's clearly for criticizing the shooter. But we're, we're trying to ferret it out right now and doing some testing. But uh, I'm not going to apologize for saying the guy was wrong to shoot the four Marines. I know I'm racist and bad. It's like a liberal sacrament to blow a Marine's head off when they're unarmed. I, I get it. You're, you're the good guys. I'm the bad guy. And everything, but you're sick freaks. And Zuckerberg's a sick freak. Uh, Peter Schiff, Europac.net. Peter, you got about seven minutes left. I know you got to go. I uh, appreciate you coming on. Um, I consider and ask my economic questions all day. The Greece situation, any more on that? Uh, what else are you looking at? And then what's some good news? Well, before I even mention Greece, as long as you're talking about McDonald's and restaurant sales, you know, we, and the retail sales numbers that came out this week. We actually had a drop in restaurant and bar sales uh, by 0.2%. That's the biggest decline since January of 2014. And, you know, the problem is, you know, uh, college grads need a vibrant uh, restaurant business because that's that's where they get their jobs. You know, you, you graduate from college and then you can land a job at McDonald's. And so that's going to be problematic for our, you know, our college grads. Um, but. As far as Greece is concerned, unfortunately, right, Greece is going to make a deal with the devil. They're going to stay in the eurozone, uh, but they're going to borrow even more money to do it. So the Greek people are going to go deeper into debt because the Greek government didn't want to deal with the consequences of abandoning socialism. You see, they need Europe's money to continue to make payments to Greek voters, even if they have to deliver some bad news and tell uh, you know Greek pensioners and government workers that they're going to have to take some cuts. They would have to take much bigger cuts if they actually left the eurozone. But that would actually be a good thing because what we need is less government in Greece and more freedom. Instead, they're going to agree to higher taxes. They're going to continue to keep people on the dole. And ultimately, there's going to be some kind of violent revolution in Greece because this is not going to work. Uh, what's going on? Is this about Western governments and the robber baron class living for the day and, and, and just robbing the bank? trying to build their armored redoubt, you know, in some faraway place, as they're now doing, headed for the exits, that there really isn't a big conspiracy. They kind of had a big global government talk to, to, to act like they had an exit plan, but really their exit plan is the collapse of civilization with all the stealing and the socialism and the redistribution because they never back off the socialism or the, or the corporate welfare. They seem to only double down. And if you study history, I mean, I was reading yesterday in the London Telegraph and also... Uh, in, in several other papers, they, they say Rome is a rotting, festering rat hole now. Just 10 years ago, it was nice. Other mega cities are falling apart. I was back in New York recently. It looked like a third world country. It was looked nice 10 years ago. I go to L.A., it looks scary, except in certain areas. I go to Dallas. I grew up there. It looks scary. What is going on? Yeah, well, first, you know, it was a mistake for the European countries to have come together in a union It was you know, because of politicians that wanted more power, that they sold it to the people. Uh, but it wasn't a good deal, uh, not because it's forced, it's preventing Greece from printing more money, right? It, the problem is it's putting all these countries together is just growing the government. And I know Germany couldn't afford to allow the moral hazard of forgiving the Greek debt. So they have to keep them in there just so they can send a message uh, to everybody else. But, you know, it was a mistake now looking back for our states to have come together. You know, the 12 initial colonies, you know, given where we are today, we would be better off had they never formed a central government and had they stayed uh, independent states, uh, maybe had we operated under the Articles of Confederation instead of the Constitution, because what the original framers intended was a very small 
federal government with very little power that would only tax us in times of war. And it would only deal with disputes between the, the states. Yeah, and now we have an all-powerful federal government. I think most states would be better off seceding from the union. The, the average state would be better off if he wasn't part of the United States, if it was a separate country and it can operate with a lot less money. But now we're stuck together in this very imperfect union. Well, I agree with you. And, you know, I've said we can have the states secede under the Declaration of Independence and then reform with a real limited federal government. B yeah, because we saw, happened, we saw what happened last time. They tried that. There were some southern states that tried that. And we had, you know, the Civil War. So it didn't work out so well. And then as a result of the Civil War, we got paper money. We got the income tax. We got all kinds of other bad things. But see, you're a smart guy. You know the real history of that. Nothing, it had nothing to do with slavery until the end. And 2% of the South had slaves. It's a total red herring. It was all about Western expansion, all about tariffs in the North on Southern goods. And then they just tell the public, no, it was about hating black people. When in truth, that's why uh, Robert E. Lee was the top general in the North, the commandant of West Point. They wanted him to be the head of the Northern forces. And he said, I don't want to do this, but this is illegal what you're doing. I have to go join the South. And Robert E. Lee hated slavery. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, slavery was bad, no question about it. At least the one good thing that came out of the Civil War was that it ended. Of yes. course, it would have ended anyway, eventually. But, you know, there was more racism in the North than there was in the South. You know, but the, 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 the reality was that Lincoln didn't free the slaves until the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. We were two years into the war. And the reason he did that was because France was threatening to come to the aid of the South. And so Lincoln had to make it about slavery rather than about something else. So it ended up that we got to free the slaves. But that's not why the war started. But again, you're you read books, you read history, which makes you a racist. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm being sarcastic because with the new political correctness, they just trump our facts with just claiming we're racist, we're right wing, we're hateful. I mean, I don't think you call yourself right wing. What do you call yourself? Just a free market guy. Yeah, look, I would have loved it if Thomas Jefferson had had his way and the original Declaration of Independence emancipated the slaves, but we wouldn't have had the document. They had to cave in. And you know, just because I understand the true history of the Civil War doesn't mean I'm pro-slavery. No, exactly. It's horrible. And the fact is, it's bad economics. That's why it was dying out all over the world. There's only, I think, maybe one other nation in the world that fought a war to end slavery. Every place else that had it, you know, it went away on its own. And it would have gone away. It might have taken another 20 years. But, you know, we wouldn't have had Jim Crow. We wouldn't have had a lot of the, the problems and the animosity that existed following that Civil War. Uh, and so I think ultimately this, the descendants of slaves would have been much better off had we not fought that war. They would be free today. Uh, but I think and the nation would have we would have saved millions of lives. The economic damage that resulted from that war was horrific. And the government used the war to usurp all sorts of powers. I mean, I think if we never fought that civil war, we wouldn't have the income tax today. We might not have the Federal Reserve. We might still be on a gold standard and we wouldn't have any slaves. So we'd all be a lot freer. Well, plus, if they do the background, most Americans that came here of any color their ancestors came here after the Civil War. Most white people have no connection to slavery. And so it's, oh. it's just asinine. Well, of course not. And of course, very few whites own slaves. And in fact, in fact, there were even some blacks that owned slaves. So, you know, it wasn't like, you know, it was only whites. But look, I don't want, look, it was a terrible thing. Slavery is the worst no, thing. No, no, I happen. totally agree. The, the, I mean, the <laughs> issue is we're here watching the country in deep trouble. And this is still the biggest issue out there that they use okay. as a diversion. It is a diversion. And you look, look, I I'm Jewish. I mean, you know, there were there were Jews that were enslaved at one point, too. But I'm not you know, it, it, I don't I'm not owed anything as a result of it. We have real economic problems and we have modern slavery. So the Babylonians and the Egyptians don't owe you anything. No, we're all <laughs> slaves to the U.S. government. The way I look at it, this is one big giant plantation and the government takes half of everything I earn and then they try to control everything that I do. You know, the slave owner only got 10 percent of his slaves production. So the U.S. government gets a lot more from me economically than any plantation owner got out of its slaves. That's right. And so we, ha we have to we have to get rid of these chains. You know, we have to free ourselves, emancipate ourselves from this current system. And we have to go back to what the founders envisioned, not just for us, but for all the people in the United States, black, white, sure. immigrants, whoever it is. We all need to be free. So I agree. Peter Schiff, powerful yeah. point uh, in 60 seconds closing. How do we launch a peaceful global slave revolt worldwide to stand up and say, 
We're paying 60, 70 percent in France, 80, 90 percent to a bunch of corrupt government bureaucrats that are above the law and tax exempt in most cases. That's the most incredible part about it is that we are truly slaves. How do we become free again, Peter Schiff? You know, I don't know. I mean, my dad tried it. You know, he's 87 years old and he's still in jail because he stood up for the Constitution and, 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 and wasn't paying. By the way, your dad is in prison for writing a book. Well, writing books and advocating that people follow the law the way he sees it and, and not pay taxes. So you can't just stop paying unless you're willing to risk going to jail like my father. I mean, look, we can vote. We can vote for Rand Paul. You know, we can vote for people who profess to support the Constitution and stand for liberties. But it is very difficult. And, you know, we've got an army of Americans now who are beholden to the federal government. They, 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 they divvy up the loot that the government steals sure. to outvote us. So it's very difficult. You know, we, we are enslaved by democracy. You never, and the founding fathers, you know, also didn't like democracy. Sure. They tried to save us from democracy by creating a republic. But the republic has collapsed. And we're living under the tyranny of democracy. Well, let me show a Forbes article about your dad, Erwin Schiff, who I was pretty good friends with. Interviewed him in person probably 15 times. Spoke on the lecture circuit with him. Really cool guy. Uh, Forbes headline, Ninth Circuit Rules, 85-year-old tax protester should stay in jail. I followed your father's case closely, obviously not as much as you. But I remember it being in the Las Vegas Review Journal with a straight face. They reported that the judge said, okay, I'm gonna, you're not going to go to prison. Don't put your book out anymore. Yeah. And yeah. your dad said, no, you put the book out and went to prison and he's been in there. How I mean that he is a political prisoner. I mean, your yeah, dad's a hero. His book, I think, other than Lolita, it was like the only book that the government's ever banned His book, The Federal Mafia. You know, if you haven't read his economic books, you know, they really influenced me. I still have copies, you know, the biggest con, King of Malls. I mean, if anyone goes to, you know, my shiftradio.com, I have a bookstore there. You can order, you can order these books. I don't have that many left, but they're, they're, you know, I got them in my garage. But you know, he really influenced my my economic way of thinking. Wow, thought, I didn't know you were selling these banned books. How evil! No, but let, not, let's put a minute two on your dad, then I'll let you go because I, I never want to bring your dad up because I know it's private. I should have asked you, but you brought him up. What a cool guy! How much energy he's got! How is he doing after a decade in prison? Look, he's still alive. Most of his friends aren't, you know, none of his sisters are still alive. You know, so a lot of people that haven't made it to 87 and, you know, he's relatively healthy. I think he'd be in better shape if he was in a real hospital and not a government prison. But he only has a couple years left in his sentence. So hopefully he'll stay healthy long enough uh, to get out so he can see his grandchildren and spend some time, you know, with his family, you know, before, you know, he meets his maker. But, you know, he he really believed in what he did. And it's unfortunate. But, you know, uh, the, the principles that he stood for, they're, they're, they're vibrant, they're it's still alive in, in a lot of people's minds. And, you know, a lot of the forecasts that he made in his book, The Biggest Con, that's the one I, you know, I still sell that he wrote in 1972, 1973. All this stuff is coming true. You know, his book was very prescient, but it was obviously very early because a lot of the things that he forecasts are happening now. Much of the stuff happened later in the 1970s. Yeah, your dad battled the Federal Reserve, the New World Order, everything. And, uh, and he did it for, gosh, like your dad's been around 40 years and longer doing this. And he's somebody we don't talk about in prison right now. I remember reading the thing. Judge sentences him to long term for republishing book. I mean, that is just. But meanwhile, people can run around at shopping malls with ISIS flags. Uh, uh, incredible. Peter Schiff, Europac.net. Look forward to talking to you again in two weeks, sir. And say hi to your dad next time you talk to him. I will. All right, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just forget his dad is a real live political prisoner, ladies and gentlemen. A real live political prisoner. I mean, go research it. They tried to put, he was here in studio two weeks ago, or, or a week and a half ago, they tried to put Joe Bannister, highly decorated, seven years as a treasury agent, armed treasury agent, and he heard a radio show saying the Federal Reserve's private, the IRS never got ratified, the income tax, he didn't believe it. He set out to disprove it for two years, found out it was true, went to his superiors, and they said, he said, I'm going to have to resign if you can't tell me this isn't true. And they said, listen, the fact that you even looked into this, resign. And then now the, the, his buddies call him and apologize, and now all know it's true. But they tried to put him in jail not once, but twice in the last five years. And he got jury trials. And the juries would go out and tell the news. It's like they proved his case. And all he was doing was giving speeches as a CPA. Look how Lois Lerner is trying to put everybody in prison. And she didn't get in trouble. 
I mean, th folks, this is Nazi or Soviet level. I mean, this is chilling. I just got chills, so I'm saying chilling. I mean, my body just chills because I know I'm up to bat here. I don't like it. I, I can really feel the wings of the New World Order flapping around me. They are. It's only because we're so public that we're even still here. So please pray for us.